19, 2020 Board of Library Trustees regular meeting, the second virtual meeting to order at 6.07 p.m. We're going to proceed with the roll call with Secretary Barshish, followed by a roll call of introductions of the guests, count of the guests. Jan? Mm -hmm. Do you want okay. to call? Sure. Trustee okay. Barshish, here. Trustee Fishman? Here. Okay. Uh, Trustee Johnson? No? He's not here. Okay. Um, Trustee Riddle? No. Here. She said here. Present. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, Trustee Rogers? Here. Is that a yes? Yes. 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 Okay. Trustee Wolf? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Okay, so for our guests, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read your name, and if I don't have a last name for you, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself and to state your name for our record, please. Um, so going across my screen, I see um, Shanti De Costa. I see a Suzanne. Suzanne, is that Suzanne Arist, staff member? Services. Thank you for being there, Suzanne. Um, I see Alice Joseph from our staff, uh, Jillian McEwen from staff, uh, Georgia Gebhardt from League of Women Voters, Sarah Beth Brown from staff. I see Liz. Liz, is that Liz Seeger? Yes, it is. Hi, Liz. Liz from League of Women Voters, well met. Thank you for being here. Uh, we have uh, Deborah Thompson from the library. Anne Prohoff from the library, Rebecca Nakwin, uh, Brana Nakwin from Circulation, the library, uh, David Bliss, Amy Barrow, Jennifer Bartell, Andrea Von Johnson, Amy Young, Louise Nydorf, Jessica Thompson. Uh, da, 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 I'm catching up with my list. Uh, Patsy, Patsy Devono from uh, Shelving and Switchboard, uh, Gail Justman, Marty Belfontaine, and I have another, uh, those are all staff members, and another caller um, with the last four digits of 0969. Can you identify yourself, please? This is Rosemary Hall from Tech Services. Thank you for calling in, Rosemary. Thank you. Okay, uh, those are those are all of our guests. We're ready to move on to the next portion of our agenda. Okay. Uh, immediately behind tab number one are the minutes from our last meeting, from the April 21st, 20. Uh, 20 meeting. Are there any, is there a motion to adopt it? So I motion we adopt the minutes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. I so, have some. Okay. Are there any questions? I'm sorry. Who seconded the motion? Ron Rogers seconded the motion. Thank you. Stuart, uh, okay. Discussion? Fina? Yes, under action item number six, I believe it is. Um, I, I wanted to see, I, I didn't have enough time to draft something, but we did have um, some discussion there that I wanted to see the highlights um, of the discussion added to the minute. And um, we had, I had a question in particular about um, the alternate, I shouldn't say question, I had some suggestions about some alternate um, uses or a resolution of the muddy area and we had some discussion about the safety and the liability exposure on this space and 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 so I think it's important to have it as part of the record because I was the only um, trustee that didn't um, you know hadn't I didn't have the 
I, I, I was the only trustee that didn't approve. And so I think it's important to have that be part of the minutes. Why don't you write and submit it to Anthony and then we will move the approval of the minutes to the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Were there any other comments about the minutes or is that the only item? All right, so Fina, oh, go ahead, Ron. I move that we defer approval of the minutes for the April meeting to June. I'll second it. Stuart seconded it, Ron deferred it, okay. And that, is there a need to vote? Yes, voice okay. vote is extension. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't require a roll call. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passed unanimously. Okay. There is no presentation. Let's go switch to number uh, section number five for the treasurer's report. Trustee Rogers, our treasurer. Okay. You have the uh, financial information in the packet. Um, uh, as contrasted with February and March, when we received over two and a half million dollars in tax, uh, real estate taxes in um, the past, in April, we received under $70,000. That's normal. Um, the, um, uh, we also received uh, about $11,000 in interest income um, and $2,700 in uh, miscellaneous income. Expenses uh, are at 76% of anticipated or of the annual budget. Um, that's well below the uh, 10 month rate, which would be 83%. Uh, that's to be expected under the circumstances that we're in. Um, the, there isn't anything extraordinary uh, in the rest of the financial information uh, that is in your attachment. Um, the only item that, uh, that we need to take action on with respect to this is approval of the April bills and salaries, uh, which I so move. I'll second. I second it if you didn't hear me. Okay, so Ron has moved and Stuart has seconded. Um, is there any discussion of the bills and salaries? Oh, I see Lisa's talking. Let's, I'm sorry, let me, I'm gonna unmute you, Lisa. Or you can unmute, there you, there you okay. go. <laughs> okay, pending no discussion, can we have a vote on, for the approval of the bills and salaries for April 20, 2020? Okay. <clears throat> Trustee Barshas? Yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Uh, absent. Trustee Riddle? Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. Behind tab number six. Wait a minute, there I am. Uh, We're on tab four. Okay. Tab four. Behind tab four, there is the ordinance. 20, number 2020-21-192, setting the dates for the regular meetings for the Wilmette Public Library Board for the 2021 fiscal year. Is there any, is there approval, is there any discussion, does someone would like to, someone like to make a motion to adopt the ordinance? I'll motion we adopt them ordinance. Is I'll second. Any? Okay, Stuart, Trustee Wolf, 
has made a motion to adopt motion ordinance number 2019-20-196. And I believe that Trustee Fishman has mm -hmm. submitted the motion, which sets up the schedule for our 2021 fiscal year. Can we have a roll call? Well, is there, is there a discussion? discussion? Is there any discussion? Nope. I have a question. I just wanted to ask, is this the typical time given, um, especially around the holidays? I've never, I don't think I've been part of the holiday approval yet and um, wasn't sure if there was oh, uh, there additional is, time. No, there wasn't a holiday approval. I think that the holidays were listed just so that we're sensitive to it when we're scheduling our meetings. Was that the question? It is. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I so, thought more time. I, I was like, wow, I thought this would be more time, but I get it. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is a, a, the traditional day that we set it the third Tuesday of the month. And if days and we sort of switch it. So that's why that was put in for information. Any other discussion? This okay. Require, this doesn't require a roll call. It's a roll Okay, so, well, it does have A's and A's and absent or not voting. So in terms of what we have to submit, so let's just do a roll call. Okay, <clears throat> Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Aye. And Trustee Johnson, absent. Okay. Immediately behind there is the, we are required to do this every year. And it's the decision in terms of the policy to accept. In case someone that is, does not, is, not, is a non-resident and wants to procure a Wilmette Public Library card, this allows us to one, sell that, uh, person a library card, but it also outlines our service policy to residents and non-residents who are Wilmette property owners or who also hold uh, library cards that we accept. And in the, since I've been there here, I don't recall anyone ever wanting to purchase a Wilmette pu public library card because they can use it with their own library card. Plus one of the things that Anthony brought up is there are very few unincorporated properties in the district. So most have a library card. Does anybody want to add something else to this? Trustee Rogers? Um, the bottom line here is that there was a period of time when um, Glenview was not in CCS. Um, and we did have some issues with respect to um, non-resident um, participation in, in services. Um, that has been remedied. Glenview is now part of CCS. So this has not had any issues or problems uh, in the last several years. Um, so uh, I move that we approve um, the decision to participate in public non-resident, public library non-resident services. I'll second it. Okay, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers. Uh, is there any discussion before we go on with the vote? Any Trustee Riddle? As I was wondering, has this, this, it says November 2016, has there been any changes um, or revisions to this since November 2016, if you know? Uh, no, there have not. This is the most current document. And I don't know if anybody had any, any changes after reading it for today's meeting or any questions. What will happen is there was one question I had with Anthony, but in the, when he when they go to review policies, this is one of the policies that will be reviewed at that point in time. Oh, the policy committee. Yeah, the policy committee. 
And then at that point in time, we'll bring it before the board for approval. Okay, sounds good. So maybe like within the next year or so, we'll, we'll review this. If all this goes and... well, we can meet and yeah, it will be. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering, I had one question that maybe we can discuss at the committee, but for the non-residents who um, would like a, a, you know, library car, they must provide a real estate tax bill. Um, if you're a renter in this area, are you an are you considered a non-resident? Oh no. Is if you live in the area and if you're renting, you're considered a resident. If you because you bring a tax, I think you bring a bill with uh, something with your address on it is one thing. And Anthony, you can. There are two pieces of ID that you usually bring to prove that you live and reside in here. Sure, I get it. I got it. I just wanted to know about renters. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. I, I will look forward to the policy discussion, policy committee discussion. Then. Okay. So it's been moved and seconded that we accept the section 3050 of the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules to participate in the Public Library Non Resident Service Program. All, uh, do we need a roll call? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so everybody has approved it with one abstention due to absence. Next, we're doing, um, we every month, because it's a requirement of trustees, uh, our director has put in a, a chapter, and so this current chapter looks over safety and what's required of the library in terms of in terms of things that are safety standards and i put in a call to him and i think the only thing where we need uh, there's some work to be done is number number 17 when and which will be taken care of when we look at our security cameras and when uh which is libraries with security cameras must have a policy for use and guidelines, including real-time access, archived access, and record retention. Signage notifying the use of cameras must be, be displayed. There is a, uh, a sign that notifies that they are uh, patrons and that they are being videotaped, but I think you might want to add some more to it, Anthony, based on our discussion. Everything else was pretty much the library does. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the library does meet or exceed the library, the uh, safety standards um, as expressed in, um, in this guide as, as contained in your packet. Um, it's true what Lisa said about our security cameras. Um, we are in compliance with uh, the standards as listed there. We are doing all of those things. Um, the point that I was trying to make is that we have an opportunity to improve upon that. As we've been, been discussing over the course of the last year or so, um, we are due for an upgrade of our uh, security camera system, and we wanted to do that project concurrent with an access control upgrade. Uh, the access control system would be an upgrade of our, um, our, uh, our, key, our key system um, and the way that patrons are the public. I'm so sorry. There's some feedback here. I'm going to mute somebody. Thank you. Um, uh, basically, what, what we're looking to do um, is to upgrade the security camera system and the access control system concurrent with the next renovation of the library. Um, now, given the state of the current pandemic and some of our planning needs going forward, um, we may elect at some point to defer those plans. Um, so we may want to break out this project separately so that we can continue to improve uh, safety and security within the library, um, uh, e even if that means that it would, we would lose a little bit of our economy of scale in terms of savings when we would do such a renovation. Um, but this is, this is not a critical infrastructure matter that we need to deal with today. It's just something that has been on our radar and something that we would want to beef up in the future. But just to clarify what that point was about. But we do meet all the standards. Any, any questions about the content behind that tab? Okay, um, we are a, a little out of order. So um, we, we skipped the, um, the item that's probably- Now for the most important one. <laughs> so, um, 
So yeah, so I think that's probably my call to get on there and talk about that last item. So um, the first discussion item this evening is discussion of the library's pandemic response plan and to um, what, our, what, our, what our plan is for the next couple of weeks. So let me do that. I'm gonna mute a couple of these um, callers at the moment so that we don't have the feedback here. Thank you. Okay. Um, a lot has changed in the course of the last couple months, and um, we've had some, some plans that we put before the board uh, at the April 21st meeting, and I think a lot of that content remains the same in that initial plan. Um, the plan is for reopening the library in stages, and we have a number of phases that we're planning to do this in. Um, with each week, we have been given new information, um, and within the last two weeks, we have learned from the IMLS study that was funded by RAILS that um, the, the, the duration that we're going to need to quarantine our items is longer than we had initially anticipated. Um, when it comes time for us to accept returns of materials, we have learned that our previous assumption of a three-day quarantine of those materials may not be sufficient. Um, preliminary data is suggesting that seven days would be a more appropriate um, time to quarantine those materials to be doubly sure that the virus is not going to be transmitted on the physical materials that are going to be circulated. So that has shifted a little bit of our assumptions in our planning process, but has not derailed the initial planning that we've been doing. Over the course of the last couple of weeks, staff and I have been talking about what our plans are and how we can best abide by those while also still abiding by the governor's uh, shelter in place order. Um, this past week, we were anticipating that the governor may in fact extend his order. Um, when he was stating that the peak of the virus for our region was going to likely hit at the end of June, we were nervous. We thought, oh my goodness, does this mean that this is gonna get kicked down a little bit further and be extended into June? Um, that unfortunate, or, or fortunately or unfortunately, <laughs> however we want to interpret that, um, the, the existing order remains in place and we expect that the shelter in place is going to expire at the end of May. As such, um, it is the library's plans to begin to incrementally bring staff back into the begin, back into the building in early June in an effort to resume uh, select in-person physical material circulation services. Now, the way that this is gonna work right now is this is our current operating plan. Um, this week, we are working on coordination and communication. So staff is, is having meetings, we're working out our logistics, we're developing schedules, we're uh, exploding the model. We're looking at all the details and putting together our communication tools. Once we have all of these factors in place and we know what direction is that we're gonna go forward, largely informed by the action that I expect you to take here in a moment, we will put together our communications and share them with the public at large. We'll put that information on the internet, we'll put it on our website, on our, on, um, on our Facebook page, and we'll send out communications so that the public knows what we're doing next. The plan for next week, following Memorial Day holiday, where we will be closed as usual, um, we're anticipating or preparing to do some degree of returns. Um, the way that the returns would work would be a contactless um, bunch of bins that we will wheel out into the parking lot, and I am preparing to be the one to do this, um, and will allow patrons to come back during select hours and drop their materials into these bins. We're calling this contactless returns because patrons are not gonna be interacting with the book drops. The book drops that are attached to the building, the remote book drops that are off site of the library and the book drops that are in the parking lot of the library will remain closed. Um, that way we can ensure that there's no transmission of the virus potentially on those pieces of equipment. Um, by having the returns done in the parking lot directly to these bins, it also allows staff the ability to manage the volume of materials that's gonna be returned. As I reported previously, there are over 30,000 items that are currently in people's homes and have been since March. We're ready to start collecting those materials and placing them in quarantine for a week or more. And we've allocated a space for that and we're ready to start collecting those returns. The reason we wanna start doing the returns now before we start pushing out more holds in June is because it's gonna be a multi-front battle uh, for us to, um, to manage all these materials coming in and out. Um, we wanna get a handle on this first to see what that volume looks like 
and to try to collect as many of those items as possible before we start putting more items back out into the community. Now the staff will not have to do very much to interact with these materials that are being returned because we are going to quarantine them for seven days or more. So the way that this would work is next week we would announce what days we're going to offer the returns. We'll set up those hours. Patrons will be able to drive into the parking lot and hand their materials over into these bins. We will then take the full bins after that series of, of sessions have ended and take them down into our auditorium where they will either be unloaded on the tables or just left in the bins. Now, preliminarily, we have enough bins that we think we can meet the demand for next week. We've ordered additional bins because we know we're going to need more for this process going forward. Um, but for right now, we think we're gonna be okay to start this process next week, given the materials that we have right now. And then we'll just have to adapt as we go forward. So returns will start first, and we're gonna commence that process next week, selectively for a few hours each day. Late next week, we're going to begin calling um, patrons who have materials that are already on the hold shelf. Uh, these are people that have been waiting uh, for, for these materials since March. Um, we have not been pulling the materials off, the whole, off of the shelves for these for patrons uh, since the closure. These are the items that have just been sitting there since, Mar since March 13th. We're calling those patrons individually and we're asking them if they still want the materials. If they do, we're setting those materials aside. If we don't, we're gonna start bringing those back into circulation and let them go on to the next person on the holds list. Um, this also gives us a chance by calling everyone directly to help explain what our process is going to be going forward. It gives a personal touch point for the, for the staff to interact with the public in this fashion. Um, the idea then um, late next week would be to coordinate the pickup of those items beginning June 1. So when we start bringing our teams of staff back into the building on June 1, um, where we're going to have a different team working each day, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, we will selectively have hours uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from, uh, from 2 to 6 on those days and from 10 to 2 on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Uh, so that gives us four hours of direct service each day to provide uh, pickup of holds. Um, and we're going to coordinate that over the phone. The way that this would work then that week is when a patron knows that they have an item to come in and pick up, they've already engaged with us about that, they'll come to the library and there will be a designated set of spots right outside of the, the back entrance of the library where patrons will park their cars in a numbered spot and then call a phone number that's listed there. If you've done fast food service or anything in the, in the last couple of months, this is a very similar model to what you're seeing there. Patrons will call that number a staff member will collect the item uh, for, uh, for that patron, bring it out to their vehicle in a bag, and set it on a table or chair that's in front of that parking space where that car is parked. The staff member will wave at the person and say, this is your thing, I've got it right here for you. I'm gonna walk away, and then you can get out of your car and come get this item. And that's what makes this whole process contactless and helps protect the patrons and the staff. Uh, this process will begin uh, on June 1st, as I said, and um, we'll begin going through the pick list of items that pa patrons have been placing on hold uh, beginning on June 8th. So we're going to have about a week or so to work out the kinks of this with the 800 items that are on the shelf currently for patrons, and then we'll start picking through the rest of those items and start feeding those to patrons beginning June 8th. Uh, that's kind of the nutshell piece of how this works. The logistics of it is that we have um, a different team of staff members working each day. Um, our current plan is in an effort to sustain our operations once we begin resuming physical uh, material circulation, we wanna make sure that nothing is gonna derail that process. We wanna make sure that all the health and safety precautions that we're taking are validated. And one way that we can do that is by having a different team working each day and in the event that one person on that team should get sick, we would be able to then pull that individual off and quarantine them. Or if we needed to, we would, we would quarantine the entire team that worked that day. We will do this by monitoring um, people's health each day that they report to work. If they're presenting any symptoms, um, they would be asked to return home and they would be asked to self-isolate until their symptoms um, are no longer present. Uh, so that's kind of the 
That's the general gist of how we're going to manage those operations. Do you have any questions for me? Fina. This is Joan. Could you okay. just say what happens June 8th as a new holds or are they, I wasn't sure what you meant. I understand June 1st, you'll be calling in that whole process, but June 8th, are they, if someone now wants to put a new hold in, does that happen on June 8th or could you just briefly review that again? June 1, I guess, sure. but. Right. So the first, June 8th. Thank you. The, the first week of June, we're going to be processing all of, and delivering to patrons via our remote, our contactless pickup, all of the items that are currently on the hold shelf today. Those are the very same items that have been on the hold shelf since March. We anticipate that the majority of patrons that are there will want their items still. So that's our first week. Then on June 8th, we're gonna start running our pick list. That is a daily operation that we do when the library is normally open, when staff is in the building. Because staff has not been in the building since June 13th, staff has not been running that report. When we start running that report again, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of items that patrons have been placing on hold since we have been closed. Those are the items that are going to start populating the hold shelf and be available on June 8th. And concurrent with that on June 8th, we are anticipating that we're going to have live phone service from our librarians. So if any of you would like to call and have a and personally request an item with a patron with a, a staff member, you can call into the library, place a hold. Uh, for an item that's on the shelf and we will pick that hold for you and you'll have that item, item available to you just like we did you know in February March Anthony my one comment if you can anybody Stuart is that um, uh, I think this is all sounds all sounds very practical and good um, when we start having people staff members calling the community will they have any kind of information sheet I'm, I'm just guessing a lot of people will have lots of questions um, and so just so that, that they'll be armed with ways to respond to the questions ideally with the answers to the questions or if not just being able to refer the, the patrons to you know the right place to get the information it's a great question Stuart. yes in addition to building a, a more robust faq that updates the information that i presented here rather clumsily this evening um, there will be a clearer communication that we will put out um, via an email at the end of this week. So if you're on that distribution list or we have your, library, your, your email in your library account, you will get an update from the library this week that will tell you all about what these services are and what our plans are going forward. The website will be updated and the staff will have that same information at their fingertips so that they can relay that information to patrons. We're going to make it as simple as possible for people to understand this. There are some details that I shared with you this evening that are a little bit more, I guess, operational and um, more, more detailed and maybe relate more to the way that we do our business procedurally as staff that the, the public really doesn't need to know about. Um, the staff can certainly address those questions as they come up, but that doesn't need to be part of our general communication. So we'll, we'll try to keep it as simple as possible so everyone understands it. Other questions? Yeah, Fina. Um, Anthony, thank you. That was also a nice, I think, highlight of our um, discussion at our or your presentation at our at our last committee meeting. So thank you for um, so quickly <laughs> highlighting all that and and providing all the important information. I think our yeah. our um, board thank needs you. to hear and thank and the public on this call needs to hear. Um, I had the same question originally that. Stuart had something similar in along the lines of would it be helpful to put um, maybe like a weekly timeline of your plans on the web page for um, you know the patrons to see before maybe they come in or um, to know what's what's possible along with that link of a possible phone number that is a live person at the other end but um, I thought that'd be helpful so that maybe week by week or day by day, people can see what's possible um, at the at the library. And then, um, you know, maybe once we get closer to more concrete plans um, of knowing, you know, other types of reopenings that can also be included on that weekly timeline or weekly update. I don't know if that'd be something to consider. And that's just a suggestion I had. And then I wanted to ask, um, about 
um, the protective gear for the staff and the bags or packages, how they would be delivered to and during that contactless pickup. Like our videos and books going to be in in a bag provided to them that's non-returnable, obviously, and that that delivery and that contact, um, I should say non-contact at um, at drop off. Thank you, Fina. Um, great, great comments all, all around. Um, that is our plan for communications. Um, we're going to offer as complete a communication as we can throughout this process. Um, I think now that we're much closer to the launch of this, the information will be will be more steady um, because there are more things that are certain at this point. So um, expect to see more communications um, just as you indicated. In terms of PPE, uh, that has been one of the contingencies of, of service. I mean, obviously the governor's shelter in place order was one of those factors, but we couldn't safely bring the staff back to work if we couldn't provide them with reasonable PPE and cleaning supplies. And now we have that. Uh, and that will be a contingency of us providing services going forward. Um, I wanted to ensure that we at least had a month's worth of supply on hand before we launched our services, and we do. Uh, we have more than that. So um, for staff who are gonna be handling um, I'm, Jan, I'll get you in just a moment. I'm going to mute your call for just one second. Um, okay, so when it comes to the PPE, we have lots of gloves. Um, we have face masks for all employees. We have at least a couple uh, face coverings, I guess I should call them. There are masks um, in a couple different formats. There's cloth coverings, and then we have these, the, the perforated kind like this as well. Um, so all staff um, are required to wear those masks. Um, and uh, the gloves are optional. Honestly, I think the gloves are maybe more appropriate when we're handling uh, the returns. Um, not, not necessary for when you're going out. We're going to continue to encourage hand washing regularly. I think that's the most effective method. Um, but uh, obviously adhering to a number of guidelines, including safe distancing and so on. Uh, so the procedure when we're packaging the materials for patrons will be, um, we have the whole material here for you. Um, and we're going to coordinate a day for you to come by and pick it up. We're going to put those materials in a like plastic bag, like they call it a t-shirt bag. It's like what you'd find at Jewel or, or whatnot, just those kind of plastic bags. Um, the little thank you bag. Um, and uh, they're disposable, but they're also reusable. They work great in your garbage can. So um, I would encourage folks to reuse those. Um, so basically, we're going to put the items in there and tie them off set them on, on the table or chair for the patron, and it's up to them to come and pick, the, pick up their item. Does that answer your question? Thumbs up? <laughs> All right. Um, Jan. Yes, I had a question uh, about the pickup when the car pulls up and the librarian comes out with the package and puts it on the table. It might be a good idea to have a sign on the table asking the patron to wait until the librarian has gone back into the library or however far back you want him or her to be. Because even if the patron may know that, this is their first time in that kind of circumstance and there may be a couple of people rushing to get the book or whatever that they wanted and off to another appointment or something. Uh, so I'm just suggesting a sign mm -hmm. when the car pulls up to stay in the car. That's a good suggestion, Jan. Um, one of the procedures that we're going to have as part of this process um, may, may or may not require such signage. Um, when the patron arrives at the library, um, they will pull into one of the designated spots for the material pickup. Right. Um, and there will be a phone number for them to call when they get here. And that lets us know that they're here and that they're ready to pick up their material. At that time, when we interact with the patron, we'll be able to directly tell them we're going to bring the books out to you right now. Please wait in your car until we have walked away to get to exit your car and be aware of your general surroundings so that you're not interfa interfacing with anyone else while you're getting your materials. Okay. That'll just be part of our procedures. Good. Um, I, I see Joan's hand. Um, just one other, I love the idea of the personal touch with the phone call. But because I've done some uh, political phone banking, many people are reluctant to pick up the phone and answer the phone. 
Will the phones all say when you're making a call, it will come up on your phone that says um, Wilmet Public Library? Or will We're, it be from people's cell phones? Yes, um, we're going to be making the phone calls from within the library. So it, the, the caller ID will state that it is the library calling. Okay. One of and, the, uh, uh, go ahead. Well, if, if, you know, so many people either are not available or don't want to pick up the phone, um, it, most of the time, because you have their email, could all this also be done via email if you don't get a response with that phone call? All right, so a lot of these questions are, are really operational and procedural, and I appreciate your attention to those details. Some of these details are still going to be worked out. Um, part of this relates to uh, the CCS document that I sent you. Tomorrow, the CCS is holding their governing board meeting, and we're going to be voting as a member of, the, of the, the consortium on a number of things that will affect, I think, some of these operational details. Um, CCS is attempting to try to have a more uniform set of policies that all member libraries can abide by. And that will help us to be pretty lean as we operate going forward. Um, email, emailing, texting, um, other, note, other forms of notification, yes, we, we would love to automate this as much as possible and have it be just like normal. Um, we like the idea of being able to have that personal touch because we understand that people are gonna have questions as we're resuming this service. Um, we also know that that's more time consuming um, but we also feel that that might be the best way to get our communications clear to each individual because everyone's going to have a different way of understanding the information that comes to them. So it may be a blend. It could be any variation of these things. It could be something else entirely. Um, but we will do everything with, with the notion that we want to be as clear in our communications as possible and to make it as simple for everyone involved. Um, I, I see Lisa's hand. Two questions. What accommodations are you going to make for those that are handicapped that might have difficulty getting in and out of the car? And the second, in terms of employees, will be that will they be self-monitoring and you won't be doing the temperature checks and that because I know that can be a lot another type of liability. Um, so starting with the temperature checks, um, we're electing not to go that route. We do have thermal thermometers and we'll make them available to people, uh, to staff who. Um, who would like to have that their, their temperature taken, but we are not going to mandate that the temperatures get taken every day. Um, we're still working out the details of whether we're going to have a, um, a worksheet each day, a, a questionnaire form that the employee has to fill out each time. In the very least, we do have a federal document that is being posted at the entrance that says, if you present any of these symptoms, um, you need to self-isolate and go home. Uh, and communicate that to your supervisor. Um, but we're, we're still working through the logistics of whether we're going to require um, employees to fill out a form every day. Um, I, at the moment, I feel like we probably will, but um, that, that detail is yet to be finalized. We hope to make that by the end of this week. Um, regarding your question about how we would help with accessibility, um, that's another reason why having um, the, the, the personal contact over the phone is going to be a critical piece. Um, we'll negotiate that with individuals on a case-by-case -case basis. I see Ron has used the hand raise feature. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> I move that the library resume select on-site physical material services following expiration of the governor's stay-at-home order. Okay, so Ron has made a motion. I second. And Fina has seconded. Thank you, Fina. Okay, so it's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Riddle. Or is there any discussion prior to the vote? Okay, so to uh, restate Trustee Rogers' statement, he has moved that the library resume select on-site physical material services in conjunction, and that might not be the correct word, with the expiration of the governor's stay at home order. I worded it as following expiration of the governor's stay at home order. Okay, so following. It doesn't need to be concurrent with, it's simply after that has. Okay, so note that correction following. Got it. The 
expiration of the governor's stay at home order. Do we want to do it? Let's do a roll call vote. Okay. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Okay. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for that. That helps us to move in motion and to, to continue with our plans. We appreciate your motion. And thanks so much for all the details and the work you've been doing and getting it mm -hmm. back on track. Uh, now we're going to move to a review of the May 11th Finance Committee meeting draft of the fiscal year 2021 work, working budget. Trust, uh, Director Austin and Trustee Rogers. Okay. And that's behind tab number seven. Okay, Ron, do you want to summarize the meeting or would you like me to begin? Um, well, I think I, I can start. I think the basic issue is that um, there are changes that have already occurred in how services are being delivered. Um, you'll find detail about that both in the budget document that we're referring to now and in the uh, director's report that is, uh, that is uh, shortly after this. Um, the bottom line is that um, how we're delivering services is changing. There's a lot more being delivered digitally. And this budget um, anticipates that those changes will continue even as we open. The majority of these are adjustments that um, you see documented in the uh, summary of the draft working budget expenditures. Uh, that was in your board packet. Um, I don't think that we need to go through those line by line. We've done that uh, in the finance committee meeting and we will have another finance committee meeting uh, prior to the June board meeting to look more closely at some of these issues as they come into sharper focus. Um, we're reserving discussion of the personnel related items that are a part of the budget uh, for the closed session that will occur later this evening. But the bottom line is that while we're going to serve um, patrons differently uh, under the conditions that we have currently, um, we're gonna continue to provide services. Um, the details of how some of that is going to occur simply aren't available yet because it's a moving target. Uh, but I think we do have substantial detail here in the budget, uh, laying out the best estimates of what can be offered now. Uh, we will have further discussion of many of these matters um, uh, as we move forward through the budget process. Um, I think at this point we could have um, discussion of non-personnel matters if there are any questions that you want to ask um, and, and we, can, we can look at those. Um, but as I said, we're going to have a further finance committee meeting and this matter will come up at a future board meeting after the finance committee meeting, uh, after the finance committee has had the opportunity to consider these uh, changes in more detail. I'd like to maybe um, comment that I, I still think that there might be, it might be worth having a discussion or, um, or hearing about any building and space changes that are planned or having a discussion if, if, um, if we need to. Um, I, I still think that there should be, and I'd like to be able to talk about the funds that we could allocate towards those changes for building and spaces. I, I know that the contact list um, and the, the, the first phase here will likely teach us something about how we'd like to use maybe a window, maybe over the next year or two. 
a drop off window, a contactless, you know, window rather before we are, you know, kind of in full force of patrons coming into the uh, into the building. And I still think it's likely that we're going to need some reconfiguring or remodeling in the building. And 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 I'd like to know if we could have that discussion um, about allocating some of the, our budget to that to those um, items. I think it's gonna be important to really, uh, you know, try to imagine usage going forward a year or two from now. I would say that the, any such discussion is going to require uh, first some uh, further consideration of what we're asking for. And then secondly, we're going to have to engage uh, the assistance of an architect to design what it is that we think would achieve that. So it's not simply our deciding to do those things. Those are all expenditures that are likely to lead to um, a construction budget uh, to make any physical changes in the building. And that's not something that we would do in a single step. So there is plenty of opportunity for us to make those, you know, to, to consider those possibilities. Uh, we also, um, uh, in the next month or so, will be receiving the recommendations from a study we commissioned prior to the current uh, uh, pandemic with respect to our long range capital needs. And so that needs to be incorporated into that discussion. Uh, so there's certainly no problem with our uh, anticipating the need to have that kind of discussion, uh, but we will have more information with which to uh, consider those questions uh, within the next uh, 45 days or so. So I think what we want to do is incorporate those things and look at them uh, together. Um, if there are any capital needs that we need to address in the near term, um, changes in the physical structure or in the support for um, drop-off services could certainly be included in that effort. Uh, I would say also that that is not among the things that our, our architectural consultants are looking at currently because it wasn't on our list uh, at the time that, this pro that their project um, uh, was awarded. There was no consideration in February at the time that we um, proceeded or, or approved, I think it was February that we approved that. There was no consideration at that time that we would have any need to make such changes to the physical building. So um, we, we can certainly um, plan to do that, but it will require um, ex you know, some decisions that we're not ready to recommend at this time. Absolutely, I, I I didn't mean to imply that we're gonna you know kind of decide on something now. It was just the ability to have us all start thinking about um, these changes. Um, what I liked about uh, you mentioned that we didn't mention anything to the um, to the consultant back in February, but what I liked about that firm was that we are able to give him, you know, changes or them, the consultant was a male, but we'll able, we're able to give the firm, I think, um, environmental changes that were, I think we, we discussed that environmental changes that, you know, would come up and could, could possibly change the model. And um, the spreadsheet allowed for some of that um, ability um, and for, you know, just in general um, uh, contractor, prices, supply prices, resource prices could be easily, I think, incorporated into that model. So um, that's what I understood, I, I understood at least at that time. Um, and then some of the reconfiguring, I think, is more of what I wanted to hopefully d discuss and um, not necessarily any real, um, you know, remodeling yet, but, um, you know, this is the last example I'll give and uh, we'll move on, but like, you know, flooring, carpeting uh, might be something we might change. I think sometimes that's easier to clean, um, keep clean, keep sanitized. Um, 
carpeting versus like a wood floor or a laminate floor. Um, so something like that. But that's that's what I wanted to have hopefully um, happen over the next few meetings and 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 I wanted to just be on record to hopefully have that be part of an agenda item or something. Well, it can certainly be on the list of things we want to discuss. I don't know how quickly we'll be ready to move on it. I will add to um, to that, those points, Fina, that um, a lot of what you're talking about there would be projects that would be eligible for expenditure from our special reserve fund. Um, so the good news with that is that they would not necessarily need to be itemized or planned for in the general operating budget that we're discussing here today. Um, it would just be important that the board take into account that um, when we get to uh, discussion of our uh, budget and appropriations ordinance. Uh, that would be the time where we would want to allocate more money to potential renovations that would take place in the course of the next year. That would be outside of the scope of what we were generally planning for in the general operating fund. Um, as far as what is in the operating fund, um, we do have budgets in there for smaller scale projects. And the smaller scale projects have actually uh, been taking place substantially, and that's what's kind of in my director's report and what I've been talking about over the course of the last uh, couple months with you all. Um, there's been a lot of activity that we've been able to accomplish within uh, the working budget in our, our um, building improvement line. Um, so making sure that we have a healthy fund in there that allows us to be nimble and flexible to adapt, um, I think is a good thing to do. So we've, we've typically allocated about $20,000 a year for that. It's not a lot of money, um, but actually, it, you know, right now, in the course of the last couple of months, we've been using that line uh, to accomplish some of our laundry list of items that we wanted to improve upon. So um, if, if we can keep that, uh, I think, funded um, at the rate that we're recommending, I think we'll still be able to be flexible and adapt um, as need be going forward on smaller scale projects. Thank you, Anthony. And you hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly, you know, especially with the special reserve fund. I, I was hoping to hear that that um, definitely was um, possible to, to, you know, kind of reach into in order to um, pay some of these operational, if, if there's a shortfall in the operational um, fund, fund. Also, I think going forward with the community survey, I think we can bounce the ideas off the community and see what their interest is and where they see their priorities are so that we take that into consideration. There's another factor that's going to impact um, our financial situation. Fortunately, we do have uh, reserves in both operating and building and equipment reserves. Um, and uh, you may have noticed in recent times and, and the director shared information recently that the county is uh, anticipating adopting a, uh, an interest-free period for uh, payment of real estate taxes, the second installment of real estate taxes that is, that is due in August, but they're talking about extending a period into uh, at least October that would have no penalties, no interest penalties for people who, uh, because of the current uh, pandemic, uh, would be unable to pay those taxes until later than they are due. Um, under normal circumstances, if we had no reserve, we would have to borrow money in order to maintain our budget and operation. We have the reserves that, we, that will save us from having to do that. Um, and so uh, that's one of the benefits of having some reserve funds that we are not going to have any kind of an operating fund uh, problem in the, the current uh, time period or in the, in the next uh, uh, several months because of delays in tax payments. Um, we are not going to have any difficulty meeting our operating expenses during that period because of the reserves that we have. Um, now we will look at those issues. There is also another matter that uh, annually we have to update the list of projects that are in the building and equipment reserve fund plan. And that also will be an opportunity for us to consider 
when, whether we want to allocate or, or distribute some of the funds to look at some of the physical changes that might be under consideration uh, when that, that matter comes up. That's usually in June or July, isn't it, Anthony? That we consider the, um, uh, the allocation of the reserves? Typically in July, I think, is when we've done that, um, immediately ahead of when we do the BNA. Sure, those things are already in our, our, you know, our regular calendar. Um, and so we will certainly be able to look at those and make judgments about whether we want to amend the uh, past plan uh, in light of the current circumstances. So, you know, we'll be in good shape to be able to do those things uh, if we need to do them. Um, any questions from the board about the, the content of the working budget? Um, there is one item that I feel probably bears some mention here. Um, on the, um, the very last page of, of, your, uh, of this tab, um, I've given you an estimate of our revenues, um, just some general assumptions. And based off of a conversation that we had at our last finance committee meeting, um, when we were exploring um, what our future plans were regarding some of our circulation policies, you will see that there is a line item in there that I've eliminated. And this should come as no surprise because I believe in our finance committee, the whole board was present and I think we unanimously at the time agreed that we wanted to sunset the collection of overdue fines at Wilmette Library. Um, that is an assumption that I have built into this budget and that's the first time that we've memorialized that on a document here before you. Do you have any comments along the lines of that? Lisa. Yeah, I'm mute. The first time I think we discussed it was October, November, in terms of looking at trends of what other libraries are doing and given the number of books that are out and the case and the experience of other libraries that have sunset those, you know, that have eliminated the fines, you know, they found, and I think it's a good time now in terms of adding additional goodwill to our patrons, given that we have been shut down for two and a half months. And just also with all the books coming back, I think it's going to be a zoo. And I think you still will collect for books that are lost or if someone, of materials that are lost. So I'm in agreement of the uh, elimination of fines effective. July 1 and sunset. And I'm certainly prepared to, to put together some more data for you. I did share some data with you last fall when we discussed this. Um, and the, the data that I was sharing with you at the time also included uh, trending about our neighboring libraries. Um, CCS as a system at one point before governing board wanted to make a motion that to be a member of the CCS system, you were to be fine free. Um, there were a couple, only, I think only two libraries that were not planning to sunset their collection of overdue fines in the year 2020. Um, I do believe that a number of our peer libraries are planning to do so with the, begin, with the beginning of the next fiscal year on July 1. I think several libraries in our area are planning to do that. I believe Winnetka Northfield is one of those. Um, I think Evanston is planning to do this as well. Um, I will know more about that here after the meeting tomorrow, as I imagine that's one of the topics that we're all going to be discussing. Um, that said, as you can see um, on that expenditure page, and as we've discussed previously, fines were never really intended as a source of revenue for the library. They were merely a motivation for patrons to bring their materials back. And we've talked a lot about equity. We've talked a lot about the issues that are behind it. Um, and we've also talked about just locally what an impact it is to our, to our revenues and to our operations. More than anything, um, that 0.25% of our annual revenue um, really does not amount to all that much, but may in fact detract from some of our community relations. It could, it could actually have a chilling effect and a negative experience for some of our users. Um, I think that by eliminating those fines, um, we've, already, we've already extended renewals 
which has radically scaled back the collection of overdues that we've had and made it easier for our patrons to gain access. We have a strategic plan initiative to simplify our circulation procedures and to do things that are more customer oriented. So it seems like we've already got a number of things in place um, that allow us to, go, to proceed with this. And we're also not necessarily going to miss that revenue, um, what little that it is. Uh, so um, I, I would like for us to continue to, to have that here as part of our assumptions for 7-1. And um, we can discuss this maybe further or make a more formal adoption of this when we adopt the budget. Um, but when we, when we resume physical material circulation, um, it is my goal to continue to relax due dates, to extend due dates, and to not do collection of fines, and certainly not collect any, um, any fine revenue via cash, um, because we're, that's, not a, that's not a very clean thing to be doing these days. So anyway, that's, those are, I'm going to just end my little rant right there, um, but I'd like for us to continue to have that conversation um, you know, when we get closer to the budget approval in June. Ron, did you have a date, dates in mind for the next budget meeting? Because that's on the agenda to establish, set the next budget meeting. I think we can make that uh, determination online. Um, I don't think we need to decide that tonight unless anybody wants to, to try to focus it on the day right now. We've still got a number of things on tonight's agenda, so I think we could move forward and just follow up after the meeting. Okay. Thank All right, you. we'll send we'll send out a doodle poll after the meeting and schedule up our next finance committee. Okay, Anthony for the director's report. Okay, um, let's see. There's so much to talk about. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm going to I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the high points that I want to talk about and then I will open it up to you all and you can let me know what you'd like to discuss. Um, as I go through the report, some of the highlights that I think are critical that we underscore is that um, over the course of the last couple months, we have had to radically adapt. We did not have a playbook for any of the things that we've been doing. And I'm really proud of what my team has been able to accomplish. Um, we have been able to, I think, largely land on our feet. Um, we, have, we have adapted. Um, we are finding new ways to connect with our patrons. Um, we are offering chat, text, and email services that offer live librarian service Monday through Friday, 10 to 6 p.m. Um, I think that's pretty awesome that we're doing that, and we've got a, a, quite a, a substantial librarian team that is able to provide those services, and they're being used. Um, we continue to coordinate, as I mentioned a moment ago, with CCS in an effort to extend our overdue, um, or extend due dates so that there's no overdues. Um, to ensure that all cards uh, within our district are live and active. Uh, people who had blocked cards for whatever reason, if they had overdue fines or if the card had expired earlier this year, um, we took every possible step that we could to promote access, to make it easier for people. If there was a service that you needed a library card for, such as our overdrive canopy hoopla, those types of digital services, um, not having immediate access to your library card was a barrier to having access to those materials. Uh, we took every step that we could to eliminate those barriers and staff did a great job with that in partnership with CCS. Um, staff has really risen to the occasion to facilitate their communications internally. In fact, I would say that we're probably doing a far better job communicating today amongst our teams and even broadly as an organization than we have ever before. And that's largely because we're not able to touch base in person. Um, but we're having so many meetings. We're having department meetings where maybe we didn't have department meetings as often in the past. Um, we're also um, having broader library-wide meetings. Um, I'm having weekly tea with the director meetings um, on Wednesdays, and I'm doing that again tomorrow. Um, it'll be an opportunity for all staff to have an opportunity to engage with me directly and ask any questions that they may have about what our plans are going forward. I anticipate that we're gonna have quite a few people on the call tomorrow based on what we've discussed here this evening and what our plans are for June 1. Um, so that I think has been um, a great and valued service by the staff and individual department managers have been really doing that as well with their, with their teams and even teams of teams have gotten together and are doing more to socialize. We're participating in professional development like never before. Um, at, the, at the end of my report, I typically report on who attended what conference, what committee meeting, what meeting they attended, what classes that they're doing. 
Oh my goodness. And trying to compile all the monthly reports this month, there were so many um, continuing education and professional development activities that staff were doing that all I could do was just try to compile a list of each of those sessions. Um, I couldn't even get everybody's names in there. That would have got, that would have filled my entire report. I'm impressed. It's really great what the team is doing. And I think our team is going to be that much stronger going forward because of all the development that we've been doing in this like two month period. Um, we're, we're still providing so many of the services that we usually do. Um, it's true that not everyone is aware of that because most people come to the library and they come inside the physical building and that's their primary way of learning about our services. Uh, that said, a good number of our patrons are adapting to this digital environment and are taking advantage of these services. Um, as I've reported previously, we've seen our digital material circulation double and triple. Um, while those numbers have not completely replaced the deficit that's, that has been caused by the, the lack of material uh, circulating physically, um, I do think that that is a signal that we are starting to see a greater shift in our community in the use of those materials. And that is why the budget for next year reflects the investment that we want to make there. Um, a lot of our programming has shifted. Our staff has done an amazing job of putting together on the fly programming with even limited resources at home. I'm really impressed by the types of uh, story time videos and other um, immediate video access that we've been able to provide to our patrons to show familiar faces of staff within the library to our patrons who are at home remotely. We've gotten a lot of really positive feedback about this, um, not only from our own community, but patrons in other communities are able to access all of our story times and everything online. We're seeing greater reach of all of those resources. And that, interestingly enough, is also one of our strategic plan initiatives. One of our signature programs is our summer reading program. And Summer Reading Club this year will continue, as it has in years past, but it is going to be a very different environment this year. Our fabled uh, Summer Reading Club booth will more than likely not be a fixture this year. Um, that said, um, we have outlined the way that our Summer Reading Program is going to work. I've included information about that on page seven um, of the Director's Report. I'm not going to go through in detail about that here. But what I can say is that the next print publication that you're going to receive from the library will be a four page document that will summarize summer reading club for children, teens and adults and will outline the ways in which we're partnering with the bookstall and Dairy Queen to provide prizes um, as funded by the friends of, of the Wilmette Public Library. Um, we're still proceeding forward as we have in the past and we're adapting this in a way that we can still provide the same types, types of prizes and um, reward um, folks for doing the reading over the summer. So I encourage you to take a little bit more look at that and to look for your mailbox uh, mailer when you get that. Um, there's gonna be some really, it's, it's really colorful and there's a lot of really great information in that publication, so stay tuned. Um, what else can I tell you? Uh, from the technology side, I just wanted to let you know that we're, we're doing a little bit more development internally uh, technology wise. Um, Microsoft Teams, which was a product that we were going to upgrade to and pay for a subscription for, uh, is now going to be provided to us free of charge based on our subscription to their services already. We're really excited about that. Um, we will maybe not be using Zoom as much because we're going to be able to use the Teams uh, version of that software that integrates directly with Microsoft Outlook. So that actually will make it a lot easier for us to hold all of our meetings uh, and keep track of all the meetings that we're doing. Um, another cool feature of that that's going to help keep staff connected is there is a chat feature that's embedded in that. Uh, we used that at my previous organization and it was a feature that I really greatly valued. Uh, one of the cool elements of that is um, there's a feature within Outlook that will tell you if someone is in the office or at their desk or if they've been inactive. It's a great way to know um, where people are on your team and, and uh, know who's immediately available to respond to you. It's a really great resource and I'm thrilled to be able to offer that to staff here in the next couple weeks um, or more month. I don't know. It's, it'll be soon. Um, from the building side, uh, we've, we have done so much um, facilities wise. This is on page 11, but a couple pieces that I wanted to share with you. Um, today, the installation of the bluestone pavers um, out by the flagpole was completed. Um, it looks lovely, and I'm really grateful um, for your support of this project. Um, we've had a lot of rain the last couple couple days and week, 
uh, and it has been a muddy mess out there. And um, it actually was beneficial that we did this project now because they were able to put in an additional stone base that would facilitate the drainage of the water that's adjacent to that, that area. Uh, there's some planting beds that are having some runoff in them and the additional um, stone base there will help to drain that to the groundwater a little bit more effectively. So I'm glad that we took those steps there. Um, as Ron indicated earlier, uh, I did hear from Ingbert Anderson, the company that's doing our um, capital reserve study. Uh, they are getting very close to giving me some of the early stages of the deliverables on our, our study. Um, I'm hoping that I will be able to review that information uh, and receive that before our, our June meeting. Um, if I am able to get that information in time, I will turn that around and share that with you too. Um, but we're really excited to be able to share that. Um, as a part of that project, um, Ingrid Anderson pointed me in the direction of a company that digitizes blueprints. Um, Wilmette Library has never had a complete uh, digital set of all of our drawings. And uh, now we do. Um, there's, an, there's a, a picture on page 12 that shows these garbage uh, bins that we have with all these rolled up blueprints in it. That was our archive and there was no organization to those as-built drawings for the building. Whenever we had someone come in to do contracted work, we would have to hunt through there to try to find the drawings to find out where that electrical or plumbing line is, when that work was completed, was it abandoned, what, what's the story? Um, the fact that we were able to digitize all of those drawings, add descriptions to them, and create a website that we could share not only with our own facilities team, but also with contracted vendors going forward is going to greatly facilitate any of our future projects. I'm really thrilled that we were able to do that. Um, so that's completed. Um, from the HR side, um, I, could, I could talk about the HR elements of the pandemic for days. There's a lot of detail going on here. Um, just in brief summary, I will indicate here that the Families, the families First Coronavirus Response Act um, is a, a policy that the library is adopting and will be sharing with staff here very shortly. Uh, this is a federal extension of the FMLA. It also includes um, protections uh, for emergency sick leave. Uh, we're communicating all of this information to staff uh, this week, both via email and we're going to be mailing out copies so that staff have a copy of all this information and know what their rights are. Um, this information is going to greatly prepare us going forward in the event that someone needs to take leave for any number of the protected reasons that are listed there. Um, between uh, uh, Mike Boone, our HR manager, and I, we've spent a fair bit of time going through all of these procedures to make sure that we're taking appropriate care of our staff as we're planning all of our steps going forward. Um, this has been a task unto, its, unto itself, and um, we're, uh, we're, we're ready, I guess. I, I think we could use a few more people on our team to help us weed through this type of stuff going forward, especially if we start having more staff that take advantage of these resources, because there, be there will be some scheduling impacts, I'm sure. Um, but so we're doing everything that we can to take, ter ter uh, take care of staff in this process. I'm starting to, to stammer, so I think I'm going to pause <laughs> and I'm going to let you ask some questions of me right now. Is there anything else in the director's report that you wanted to discuss? No, I don't have anything to discuss, Anthony. Thank you so much. It was very thorough, um, really appreciative of your work, of your staff's work and um, your um, ability to really um, adapt and change here, all of you. Um, Thanks. All right, thank you, Fina, I appreciate that. Um, okay, um, I think we're ready to move on to the next item if there's no other questions on the director's report. So that's um, the discussion of our committees. Uh, Trustee Barshis, do you have any information to share with us from ILA or RAILS? Um, yes, I do. Um, let's see. I think that um, the quarantining deadline or the three to seven, three to five, five to seven is still a movable one, depending on how the books come through. Um, so that's something that uh, Rails has been working on and we should get a, write a definitive uh, number of days pretty soon. So that's still open. Um, as far as any articles from the ILA other than their conferences, 
closed, of course, or canceled. Um, there was an article that talked about soap and how important it was. Actually, it was a historical article of how soap was developed. But if I could just remind everybody that that's the best measure and the most frequent measure that we all should be using during this time. Um, I would also, just as an extra, this is not the ILA, but if I could just uh, add the fact that the article that Anthony, I know you've had and, and Joan has read um, from the, uh, um, let's see, it's called The Risks, Know Them, Avoid Them. If it's from, let's see, May 6th by Aaron Bromage, and it was in the uh, New York Times. If you haven't had a chance to read that, it would be very helpful, I think. Other than that, there's really nothing other than from the ILA that you haven't already mentioned. Um, I, I just, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Lisa. I just have something to add, um, two things to add. One, the links you put have a wealth of information on the agenda to both the mm -hmm. ILA and RAIL, so they've got extensive information. And then when the uh, PowerPoint presentation, when the presentations comes through regarding trustees and the pandemic, I'll send you all the link to that. I think Jan and the three of us, I think, were on that. Joan, Jan, and myself, and they had about 700 trustees on that uh, mm -hmm. webinar. Right, right. Okay, and so we'll we'll send you the link when that comes out. Okay. It's mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. And just as a point of clarification too, the, the study that Jan is referring to earlier, the, uh, the RAILS IMLS study, uh, there is information about that on the, uh, on the RAILS coronavirus page. Just look for IMLS. And there are two links that are up there currently. Um, I've had a couple patrons that have called me to ask about what our plans are and what's informing us going forward. Mm -hmm. And I did reference this, um, this study um, and uh, folks have found it very valuable. Um, I think some of the information that's contained in that study is applicable um, to a lot of materials. Uh, I think um, if libraries are concerned about what's um, the potential transmission of the virus via physical materials, I think the same may also be true of your postal mail, of uh, deliveries of packages that you may receive, or just how you generally handle things. Um, so I would just recommend that folks take a look at that information. When you put the information on, excuse me, when you put the information on the website about the seven day hold, and would you put a link to that? Yes, we'll do that. So it substantiates what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, as far as the communications go, I'm uh, further down in our information items. I just wanted to let you all know that while the ALA conference in Chicago has been canceled, um, it is going to be moving to an online environment. Um, we're encouraging staff to participate in this. Um, I don't think that there is a trustee day component um, to this particular conference. This is the broader um, ALA conference. Uh, PLA typically dedicates an entire day for trustees. Uh, but there may be some select conferences or, or sessions rather at that conference that may relate to you all. Um, I will take a look at that and I'll let you know if there's anything that might be of particular interest to you and encourage you to uh, attend if there is an option. Generally, Anthony, the day before the United for Libraries, who you listed in the minutes, will have a one day workshop for trustees. And so a lot of times they don't get it together till about two weeks before. Okay. Okay, um, on, uh, we're ready for the, the new business, old business part of our agenda. Do we have any old business? Uh, we have one item of new business. Okay, one of the things that for the last two meetings, I have contacted all the uh, trustees to see what's the best time to meet. And the times that have been thrown out there are 1230, 6 o'clock, and our traditional meeting of 730. I know that Stuart prefers 1230. He's, he's had to leave for a conflict. 
and just want to know what if there's just a general discussion. I know sometimes some uh, trustees have conflicts and can't get out till six o'clock. So just throwing it out there for what's the best time to meet in the future. The reason we were moving it earlier is because with Anthony working pretty much five days a week, he was ready. He's a lot of. He was the only one in the library in a lot of cases, and he was ready to go home after a long day. And it just so. And I think sometimes some of the minds are fresher earlier on than it drawing out later. So discussion. Um, I I think I might be maybe the only one that I, I have three kids and my husband's working from home and with <laughs> we're, we're not able to get care because of the pandemic I can't drop them off at my parents and I can't get a sitter so it's really hard for me to dedicate like if this were you know this was like an hour and a half so far I wouldn't be able to dedicate an hour and a half in the middle of the day just I can't nobody's nobody leaves me alone so I'm so sorry I, I think I might be the one that's kind of disrupting our earlier time but you know, six and on I'm, I'm totally up for it so do you all prefer six or seven thirty i'd say um earlier the better six o'clock um i wonder first thing in the morning Tina, does that work sorry you know? i i just i don't have any help i don't have any help my husband works oh, probably from like seven thirty to six thirty every day so Okay. Then Lisa, for me, early six o'clock is better. Okay, earlier I think is a little better. How about you, Ron? Six would be fine. I also have another suggestion. Uh, if me? if you want to consider uh, moving the June meeting to the twenty third, one week later, the sixteenth might be a time to consider or target uh, the finance committee. Uh, if we want to explore that in an online um, uh, survey about availability, that might be one of the options to consider. So what you're saying is move our trustee meeting a week later and do the budget meeting the time yes, that this the 16th is, is close to the earliest that you could have a board meeting. Okay. Give staff a little more time to prepare. For the board meeting, including the possibility that that would give them time to prepare for the finance committee. And right now, we have a lot of moving targets. So if we had the finance committee meeting on Tuesday the 16th and the board meeting on Tuesday the 23rd, that might provide the opportunity to be better prepared for both. It's just Anybody? A I gotta look at a calendar. Uh, staff would certainly support that. Oh yeah, that's early. Okay. Yeah, June June first is a week from Monday, so we're you know it, it, it's yeah. It's just I'm just looking. Very early in June. So, do you all have access to your calendars, and we will have to ask the two trustees. It's fine with me. It works for me. It's fine with me. Okay, Fina, it's fine with Fina. Uh, John? Good for me. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we just need to check with Stuart and Dan. Would you want the finance committee meeting at six o'clock too? The budget meeting? We can do that after the survey, but that's likely to be what works best for Fina. Okay, so six o'clock for both. Okay. That's fine. That's fine for me. So I'll just check with the other two and it's been moved. Can you not hear, Lisa, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, okay. Can you not hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I hear you. you. Okay. So I'm fine with that meeting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is there any other business? So, I have one. I wanted to ask if um, we are, um, I, I recall getting an email um, about correspondence from um, a, a patron who is a member of the Little Women's, I'm sorry, the Wilmet Garden Club or the Little Wilmet Garden Club. Is that correct? No, you, 
I think it was a, a person who, I don't think she belongs to the... No, she doesn't. She doesn't belong, and okay. she was included when we did, extensively when we decided on the landscape. Okay, so to summarize, we received some correspondence from an individual who is vocal on the landscaping. And I wanted to know if we take that into account in any way to respond in a formal way, or maybe um, just the um, the response that Anthony provided is the response that's done, and 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 we we don't need to be involved in any way. I no. think that's we're done because we 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 have a history. Working Sounds good. Sure. Okay. And I can talk with you offline. Then I just wanted yeah. to see um, uh, to get the background, but I wanted. I can talk with you offline about the yeah, background. You can talk I with me. To see. I think Jan, Jan worked extensively on that landscape. I wasn't yeah. involved in that. I just no, no it. problem. Wanted okay. to see how we respond to emails, you know, in that right. way. Thanks. Yeah, well, I think Anthony's response because of the situation now is fine. Okay. Any other new business? Can we have a motion for adjournment and no. to go? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. You do not, you want to strike the word adjourn from anything okay. to related to this next item. You have to close the meeting to go into the executive session. Okay. So I move that we close the meeting, go into the executive session for the purposes of discussing personnel and reviewing minutes. Previous closed meetings. The word adjournment cannot appear anywhere in that motion. Okay. Thank you. Is there a second <coughs> that we move into a closed meeting? I'll second. Okay. It's been, it's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by Trustee Barshi that we move to a closed meeting to uh, discuss employment compensation and past minutes and that talk about uh, human resources. Okay, so do we take a vote? Roll call. Roll call. Mm -hmm. Okay, Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Trustee Riddle? Yes, aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Uh, he ha had to leave okay. for another commitment, so he absent. Trustee McDonald? Aye. So it's been moved and seconded that we go into a closed meeting at 7.39 p.m. At this point in time, our director will move us into a private room and the uh, other observers are welcome to stay in this room and we will come back after we get out of closed session and announce the action and then adjourn the meeting. Okay, all right, so give me just a moment to figure this thing out and we'll, we'll set it up, just a second. <laughs> All right, we've got one more trustee to come out of our closed session. When Trustee Barshus gets back, we will reconvene an open session.
Okay. Lisa, are you ready to bring us back? Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Um, the WOMAT Board of Trustees is reconvening in open session at 834 after being in a closed meeting. And what we would like to do, uh, and at that closed meeting, we, uh, there, it was motioned to continue to uh, keep the minutes closed from 117.06 through 10.19.10 for five years to, until 2025, and to open the minutes from 921.16 to 319.19. Is there a motion? in open session. So moved. Okay, so Ron has so moved. Is there a second? Second. And Fina has seconded it. Jan? No, it was, it was Joan. Joan, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Joan seconded, thank you. Jan, can you take a vote roll call? Let's see if I can get you unmuted. Okay. There you go. Trustee Barsitz, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Trustee Riddle? Yes, I. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf, not present. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The budget was discussed, but given that there was no action, we have nothing to report at this time. And I move. Is there anyone? Can we adjourn? Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move. Motion to adjourn. Okay. So, Ron, motion. Sophina, you want to second it? <laughs> okay. Okay. I can't do you. Uh, Trustee Rogers moved. Trustee Riddle seconded it that we adjourn the meeting at 8.36, Jan, would you like to do a, can we just say all in favor, do we have to do a roll call? A voice vote. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Been moved and seconded, and thank you for uh, two hours and 36 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Anthony. Bye-bye.